Chair, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon and thank you for inviting me to discuss the concerns and hopes of the Irish uh, business community as we face the challenge of Brexit. As John said, we're doing this on a historic day and I think it's very fair to say a very sad day for Ireland and the Irish business community. It's the day when your Prime Minister, Theresa May, has triggered Article 50 and started formal EU negotiations to exit. Now, I have to say it's been an incredible journey that we've chaired since both Ireland and the UK joined the EEC together in 1973. And it's a journey that's contributed to a massive deepening and improvement of the relationship between our two countries. And I think it's crucial that this relationship is not undermined during the difficult negotiations ahead. I think it was reassuring to hear that um, Prime Minister May had said that um, Ireland should not be damaged in any way by the exit negotiations. She just said that earlier this morning. Now, the Ireland of today, of course, is very different to the Ireland of 1973. And before I address the issue of Brexit, I want to briefly reflect on that transformation. You know, when we look at the success of the Ireland business model today, it's easy to forget how far we've come in a relatively short period of time. Fifty years ago, Ireland's living standards were about half of the EEC average. Our economy was dominated by agriculture and old-fashioned ind industries that had been protected by trade barriers. Emigration to the UK here and indeed to the US were the only real options for people who were looking for jobs and for good quality of work. Now a number of factors, not least the strategy devised by the visionary public ser servant and economist uh, TK Whitaker, helped to move Ireland away from being an inward looking protectionist economy to a highly competitive country that has living standards among the best in the world. Key milestones included the establishment of the Industrial Development Agency in 1949, the Anglo-Irish Treaty then in 1965, and of course joining the EU again in 1973. So right up to our role today promoting the OECD corporate tax project, referred to as BEPS, and the completion of the European single market, Ireland has fully embraced the globalisation of business. Yes, a core plank underpinning this, the rise of our global business model is our low and transparent corporate tax rate. But this is just one part of a multifaceted business offering. Ireland's evolution to becoming one of the most globalised, trade-dependent and competitive countries in the world is based on a young, well-educated workforce, an entrepreneurial culture, an outward-looking approach and a very business-friendly environment, as well as the low corporate tax rate. In 2015, Ireland was the fifth most uh, intensive exporter of its goods and services in the world. Now, I've mentioned our workforce. Ireland, unlike many European uh, countries, has really positive demographics. We have the youngest and one of the best educated workforces in Europe, and over the next 25 years, our population is expected to grow by 30%, which means we will have the fastest growing population of any EU country over the next 30 years. Ireland has not only opened up in terms of trade, but also to highly skilled workers, both from inside and outside the EU, and this has actually been crucial to our success. 20 years ago, only 3% of Ireland's workforce was non-national. Today, 15.3% of Ireland's workforce is non-national, and that's twice the EU average, and significantly higher than the UK at 10.5%. But the difference for Ireland is that 48% of the non-nationals coming to us are highly skilled with third-level qualifications. In fact, we get the most highly skilled migrants of all the countries in the EU. Now this, linked with the fact that our local uh, Irish workforce are also highly educated, with almost 40% have third level qualification, has allowed us to attract businesses that rely on a deep, uh, 
talent pool to excel. So John mentioned my company, CPL, and we're Ireland's leading recruitment and outsourcing company. So we find and assess that talent that business needs. We have 36 offices in nine countries. And our specialist areas are in accounting, um, financial services, technology, uh, including, of course, the whole fintech space, which, has been, uh, which there's been great momentum in recently, um, and pharma and life sciences. I can tell you that skilled talent is easier to get in Ireland than in anywhere else in the world. And in terms of wage rates, we're very competitive. I must say, in, in CPL, we are acutely aware of the common labour market that we share with our two countries. In 2015, for the first time, more British nationals applied uh, for uh, public services numbers to work in Ireland than Irish people applied to work for registration to work in the UK. I mean, I think it's not for nothing that we know that the Dublin-London business route is the busiest, is the second busiest in the world, I think. Uh, and I think this um, common travel area is something that absolutely we need to retain. Now, CPL are also very much regarded as a barometer of the Irish economy because 70% of our business is in Ireland, 15% of it is here in the UK, and 15% is across the broader European area. And we're definitely seeing positive momentum, particularly in terms of employment and the economy. Now, of course, we were hard hit during the recent global financial crisis, and just like the Irish economy was... But the perception that Ireland, like Icarus, had flown too high has been challenged by the strength of the subsequent recovery of our economy. Our level of output is now above what it was during the Celtic Tiger area, with all sectors of the economy returning to growth last year. I believe our flexible labour market played a significant role in the recovery. It allowed businesses to adjust quickly, get lean, and improve their productivity during the crisis. Ireland is now regarded as number one in the world for flexibility and adaptability of its people. We're ninth for education and we're eighth for the highest labour productivity. Our debt rates are also plummeting. A strong social contract, um, a so strong social contract in Ireland has seen the country reduce its debt to GDP ratio from 120% to 70% in less than five years. And that was without any of the major social upheaval that we've seen in many other countries. This year, we expect to see growth of about 3% in GDP. And crucially, unemployment continues to fall. And it's due to dip to below 6.5% this year. So what's going on in Ireland? Surely, given Brexit, and the new competition from the US to bring manufacturing jobs home has caused huge uncertainty for Irish business. And if you add to that the reversal in global trade and the withdrawal of our largest trade partner from the EU, that has to be bad for Ireland too. Well, these are definitely very substantial threats. But Ireland's commitment to remain fully within a post-Brexit EU is going to provide some countervailing opportunities to us. These remain in the category of known unknowns. However, there is one crucial known known for Ireland, and that is the OECD corporation tax process. In a nutshell, the OECD process requires that corporate taxes and substance must be matched in each jurisdiction. Ireland has a decades-long track record for corporate investment, and with our common law legal structure, we're perfectly positioned to benefit from this. Ireland has indeed experienced a cascade of such corporate substance into Ireland in the last three years. Our output has increased, pushing GDP levels to heights that have attracted some scepticism, both internationally and domestically. But the truth is, for a competitive open economy, Ireland is the best example of EU success across a number of sectors. To give a snapshot of Ireland, it is home to all of our top 10 global technology of the world's top 10 global technology companies, 18 of the world's 
top 20 pharmaceutical companies are in Ireland. We have a fantastic funds industry that's world leading. And our food and drink sector is the largest net exporter of dairy ingredients, beef and lamb to Europe. Now, many reasons can be attributed to the continued success of Ireland's business model, including those I've already mentioned. But substance is actually often overlooked. Yet substance is precisely what has been built up over the last quarter of a century. Outward direct investment matches foreign direct investment. Irish household net wealth is only exceeded by Luxembourg in the EU. And I've said before, our population has increased by over 30% in a generation. So in a world where substance matters, Ireland is really well positioned. Of course, challenges remain, and not least, Brexit. As I'm sure you know, Ireland and the Irish business community is uniquely exposed to any disruption in the economic relationships that we currently enjoy with the UK. The UK is a key trading partner and the primary market for many Irish businesses due to its size, its ease of access, our shared languages, similarities in culture and a comparable legal framework. Our business communities and operations are intertwined to the point where, as I said earlier, we have a shared labour market and a consumer market. And I certainly know from the point of view of the consumer market, um, my daughter the other day, who's 21, and her friends were bemoaning the fact and worrying about that they might be charged fat when they're ordering their clothes online from ASOS and all these other sites that I know nothing about, but it seems everybody's a little bit worried. Um, but, you know, the thing is, we have worked closely together in partnership and collaboration and let's make sure that this continues into the future. Irish business hoped that Brexit would not happen. And I'm sure some of you may have felt the same way. But we understand now that we've reached the point of no return and we must plan accordingly. I think the title of today's conference is an indication of what many of us in Ireland really admire about Britain. Brexit resilience. Two words that convey, first, a grasp of the challenge that the British exit presents, and secondly, the word resilience, which suggests a determined and practical approach to making the best of an unenviable task. In Ireland, we share a similar resolve. IBEC is the voice of Irish business. We represent over 7,500 members, ranging from small and medium-sized enterprises to the largest global multinationals with major Irish operations. IBEC member companies employ around 70% of the private sector workers in Ireland, and we have 180 staff with offices in seven locations across Ireland and also in Brussels. Now, as you might imagine, Brexit is affecting much of what we are doing now, and it will do so for a long time to come. The IBEC approach to Brexit is threefold. Firstly, Irish and Irish business needs to respond swiftly to things that are within our control. We are working to ensure that every decision the Irish government makes is Brexit-proofed. Yes, we want to collaborate and work together, but we also need to respond to the UK competitiveness challenge and position Ireland to take full advantage of any inward investment opportunities that are arising. When we look beyond domestic Irish policy, we need to ensure that Irish business interests are protected in the complex exit negotiations and in the new trading relationship with the UK that we're going to have to fo forge with the UK um, in a post-Brexit environment. Irish business actively supports the closest possible EU-UK post-Brexit relationship, and this is what we must be actively working towards. It is crucial that the voice of business is heard louder and that it's understood better. In any deal, the political settlement in the Northern Ireland needs to be afforded a special status, along with continued commitment to an all-island economy. And the free travel area that I mentioned earlier between the UK and Ireland that has existed since 1922 must be preserved. Now, of course, there will be some opportunities ahead for Ireland. And I was looking at some um, new recent research, research from Towers Willis Watson, uh, where they say it's cheaper to hire entry-level staff in Ireland than in 11 other European countries. 
Middle management then do a little bit better with just nine European countries paying more than we do. But when we take purchasing power parity, or the different costs of living into account in each country, the Irish have greater purchasing power, uh, and better than many in the higher waged economies across Europe. This makes us not just an attractive destination for business, but also for skilled talent. In CPL, what we are seeing is that companies are prepared to locate their jobs where they can find the people. Last week, I was dealing with a global pharma company who um, had a senior regulatory job that they wanted to fill. Um, they located the individual in Ireland, but that individual didn't want to relocate fully. So the company have decided to position the role in Ireland. And that's the reality of the world that we live in. You can position the roles where the talent are and where the talent is. And I think that's what makes it so important that we focus on those livability factors. And I know you're going to hear a lot more about that from the other speakers today in terms of our infrastructure, um, our housing, our education system that all make Ireland a fantastic place to live and work. So if you're a manufacturer or a financial services firm a or a technology company and you're looking to maintain a presence in the EU post-Brexit, Ireland may well be the answer. This is not necessarily where we want it to be, but Ireland is well placed to provide many companies with solutions to the dilemmas that Brexit and a departure from the EU single market is likely to present. When the dust has settled on Brexit and all of us get used to new ways of working together, I foresee that our two, two islands will still continue to work closely in a spirit of collaboration and partnership. During the potential rocket period ahead, it is crucial that business in both Britain and Ireland provide leadership. Let's continue to celebrate our ties. Let's work our way through the challenge that we call Brexit and let's emerge stronger and more prosperous and closer than we have been before. That's the firm ambition that will inform the Irish business approach to Brexit and one which I'm sure we can all subscribe to. So thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. So uh, could I take some observations or questions for Anne on any of the themes that she's opened up there, please? And if you're asking a question, uh, raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you, and you might just tell us who you are and where you're from, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, Mark, Mark Beale's working for Brand Learning. Um, one of the questions I've got is around the skills gaps. Uh, you've talked a lot about the benefits and the skills that you can bring, but what about some of the skills gaps in Ireland? We do indeed experience some skills shortages, um, particularly in areas such as technology, for example. Uh, some of the newer uh, skill sets around data analytics and um, areas like that that are very new and very current while we're waiting for the universities to move forward with courses and people to get up to speed on them. Um, but what I find is because we're such an open economy, because we're an easy place to come and work and live, we're quite a destination for people with, those, with the type of skill sets we, we use. So from a recruiter's perspective, it's very easy to attract people to come and work um, in Ireland. And for example, we just did a startup um, very recently for a tech company who were looking for skills that they had really struggled to find in another jurisdiction. And they certainly felt that they may face the same issues in Ireland. But actually, you know, through broadening our search to looking right across the European environment, uh, we were well able to fulfill those roles, deeply technical roles. So I think it's really about broadening out your search, about understanding where, these, where the pools of talent are located and then um, selling the great opportunity that there is to work and live in Ireland. Mm. Thank you for your question, Mark. And I think it's certainly true. Dublin and the greater Dublin region, and not just the greater Dublin region, other vibrant regions such as Cork and Galway and Limerick uh, have become destination centres for lots of European younger talent thinking about where they want to make the next stage of their lives as well as their livings uh, in vibrant, uh, open, multicultural uh, living places as well as employment places where they're, the best, they're gaining the best of experiences in cultural life and civic life as well as business life. And that's certainly coming through in the figures that we're seeing. We have a second question. 
I'm Andrew Talbot from uh, Unispace, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm working in Dublin and London. Um, I would just incredibly impressed with the positivity but reality of your speech, and I would challenge you to try, try and make it a mantra that we can get out in the press, you know, get rid of some of the negativity around Brexit, and, and let's embrace, embrace it as a business community uh, and, and kind of move on. Um, and the challenge is yours. Absolutely. When you're in yeah. business every day, there's a challenge, isn't there? So it's just about working with, you know, but that also brings opportunity. So we've got to work with the best we have. Yeah, and that's very much the theme of today's proceedings, whether you're with us in the, in the room or online. This is about Ireland presenting solutions to genuine business issues that now arise for UK companies. It's not about closing anything, it's about opening additionally, and it's about ensuring the continuity of business for stakeholders across the globe that emanate from these two communities, from, from uh, the Greater London area, from the United Kingdom, and right across the island of Ireland as well. So thanks for your question. All right, well, just conscious of... Sorry, Greg, uh, we have one more question in the room. Thank you. Greg Clark from Digicom, a service provider based in Dublin. Um, just uh, my mum's mantra was always, if it's inevitable, embrace it. Is there anything that we're not embracing and that bridge between, that, it's a busy route between Dublin and London, in terms of going forward, is there anything more that we need to embrace and that we're not be it on, on either side? Indeed. <laughs> um, well, I just think the, the importance of maintaining uh, good relationships through what will clearly be a very difficult negotiation um, will be very important. And I suppose um, Ireland in particular um, are a bridge in a lot of ways. I mean, if you think about it, we have, you know, we have an access to Europe in probably the same way that Singapore is considered the access to Asia. And I think we just have to build on that strength while at the same time um, holding our close relationship with the UK, which is also, you know, such a destination for a lot of our indigenous companies in terms of their exports. Well, thanks for your question, Greg. And, and I think we, you, you'll find in, the, in our conversation this afternoon that other inputs to that question of what should we most embrace. And I think we'll also talk not just in the short-term view of responding to immediate events, but also using this opportunity, as Anne has characterised, around a great Irish leader, T.K. Whittaker, who thought very long-term about taking, you know, dealing with short-term issues, but also building long-term solutions as well in terms of infrastructure, relationships, uh, education for the next generation, uh, so that they're even more empowered than has been handed to us.